So when you're shopping for fertilizers, fertilizers can be very overwhelming because there's so many options. But in today's episode, we're gonna talk about what these numbers actually mean and how do you know what fertilizer is gonna work best for you. Let's go. All right, so the first thing to understand when looking at fertilizers is kind of the terminology that defines them. When you're looking at fertilizers, there are three different types of fertilizer. There is what's called an organic fertilizer, a synthetic fertilizer, and a organically synthetic fertilizer. It's kind of a hybrid between the two, and we'll touch on that one very briefly because that one kind of hangs a lot of people up. But we're gonna touch on all the different types of fertilizer that are available to you so that you can make the best decision at what is gonna work best for your garden. Okay, so when looking at fertilizers, I first wanna talk about the definitions of organic versus synthetic versus organically synthetic because this is gonna kinda of gonna help you understand what fertilizers are made of so you can pick one that you think is gonna work best for your garden. So the first thing I wanna to touch on is organic. This is kind of my home base. This is where I feel most comfortable because I understand it the most because all the ingredients in there I can pronounce, right? It's like, it's like reading the ingredients label on a bag of bread. It's like if there is ingredients in there that is impossible to pronounce, it may not be the best for your body. Um, and that, again, jury's out on that. It's just what I feel. So I tend to stick to things like yeast, salt, water, flour, whatnot, right? And so when it comes to organic, it's the same exact thing. These are things that occur in nature. For instance, you might have something like blood meal, which is a byproduct of the slaughtering industry. Whether you agree with it or disagree with it, the blood that comes from those animals is very rich in nitrogen as well as iron. And so it can be used as a, as a fertilizer and it's organic. It's the nitrogen source from the, from the blood is natural. The iron from the blood is natural. It's naturally occurring. Look at something like rock phosphate. They take rock phosphate and they ground it up and it's rock. It's found in nature. They mine it. It has phosphorus in it, which is good for your plants. It's naturally occurring. You don't need to do anything special to get it. Or even look at something like worm castings. Worms just are a natural decomposer. They're in the soil. Stuff falls from up above lands on the ground, and they say, ooh, food. And then when they say, ooh, food, the byproduct of their ooh, food moment is, ah, poop for my garden. And so a lot of people will use worm poop, worm castings, to fertilize their garden. There is naturally occurring nutrients found in the worm poop, or even chicken manure. Could be cow manure, could be goat, goat manure, rabbit manure, sheep manure. So many different manures that come from animals it could even be fish manure. And so there's so many different manures. There could even be human manure, right? Lots of people, lots of people use biosolids. Not saying it's great, but biosolids is something that is a naturally occurring nutrient source for plants. And so that is kind of the heart of organic nutrients is nutrients that occur naturally. Okay, so the next is synthetic fertilizers. Now these are fertilizers that are made in a lab. They are not going to be found in nature. And so you have things like ammonium nitrate, you have ammonium phosphate, you have like super phosphate, like which is triple phosphate. You have lots of chemicals like that, that are essentially, they, they create a chemical reaction using two compounds that would normally not collide in nature and they would create a chemical reaction so that they could actually create a, basically a, a new compound that you could feed your plants with. Now, the, again, the jury is out on these because um, while the nutrients are usually readily available, they're usually very efficient, there can be a lot of downsides with those things like the fact that there, a lot of them are a byproduct of the petroleum industry and then others are the fact that they create heavy salts in the soil. They actually create soil buildup because they don't break down and, and degrade like your naturally organic chemicals do, right? So uh, a lot of people don't like to go with those, but obviously they're usually less expensive. They're usually um, just kind of, like I said, they're usually more effective at getting the job done, but they can have a lot of downsides as well. So those are ones that again, like them or hate them, 
They do exist and I just want you guys to understand because they do obviously have some benefits. I've used them before with growing things like hydroponics where a lot of your organic options don't really work that well because organic hydroponics doesn't always go the way that you'd want it to go. And so in a lot of those situations, I've gone synthetically before for hydroponics. Um, but then you end up with the third category, which is organically synthetic. And these are chemical compounds that do occur in nature that are beneficial for your plants, but they're made in a lab. And so this could be things like, for instance, urea, right? Urea is a synthetic fertilizer, but it's found in the urinary tract of mammals. It's what comes from urine. Um, you also have things like magnesium sulfate, which is Epsom salt, and that's magnesium and sulfur. They create a, you know, they create a chemical compound. You can find this in geysers and hot springs occurring naturally. It just is extremely expensive and hard to find, you know, good amounts of this in nature. So it's just cheaper to make it in a lab. And so again, the jury is out on those types of things. I use them because of the fact that they are occurring in nature. And it's the equivalent of the question of, do, do you buy a naturally made diamond or do you buy a man-made diamond? Will anybody really be able to tell? Now, would you buy a diamond and then say, but you could have cubic zirconium, which is like not really a diamond, but it kind of looks like a diamond. You know, you could have things like that where it's like man-made ruby, lab-made ruby man-made sapphire, lab-made sapphire. They can take all the things that go into a, uh, in a naturally occurring gemstone and they can make it in a lab. Does it make it any different? In my personal opinion, no, it doesn't. But there is a story to tell, obviously, when you give it to your significant other. It's like, this came from the earth. It's special. It's one of a kind, right? But when you're applying it to your plants, I don't think your plants really care all that much to be honest. So I feel totally fine using it. That's just my opinion. But those are the three different forms of nutrients. And I kind of want to talk about the, once we talk about the different types of nutrients, I want to talk about how you can identify them on a bag. So on every fertilizer label, because this has been something that has been very widely regulated and is something that is very universal, which I love, you can very easily tell the kind of the overall nutrient composition of a fertilizer and that's by what's called the macronutrient and the micronutrient composition. Now, some micronutrients, as we'll talk about macronutrients, are your nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. Your micronutrients are anything other than that. So it could be things like calcium, magnesium, iron. It could be molybdenum. It could be literally anything that ends up on a periodic table. And so uh, those are micronutrients, and sometimes they're not in a high enough concentration to actually be registered. Though they are in there, they really can't be put on a label because it's difficult to assess and guarantee the amounts of them. And so when you look on every single fertilizer, they should have three numbers. For instance, trifecta here has a five, 10, four. That means that the first number is your nitrogen, your second number is your phosphorus, and your third number is your potassium. That is 5% by weight. So if this is a 10 pound bag, 5% of those 10 pounds is going to be nitrogen. 10% of those 10 pounds, one pound, is going to be your phosphorus. And then 4% of those 10 pounds is going to be potassium. And so uh, that is the macronutrients. Then is the micronutrients. And any micronutrients that are uh, able to be guaranteed that can actually be registered at a consistent level are going to be listed on the back as well on your ingredient label. And this is something that I firmly believe is important to have on every, I mean, it's what's required, but if it doesn't have it, I'm leery of it. I like to know what's in it so I can actually fact check it. So for instance, um, I can see here, I can see the nitrogen, I can see the phosphate, which is phosphorus. I can see the potash, which is your potassium, but then I can also see sulfur being 3%. I can see calcium, 8.5%. 8, 8 I can see magnesium at 0.8%, and I can see iron at 0.8%. And so those are your, those are your micronutrients that are guaranteed. That's like a, a consistent amount. 
Will you have even more than that? Absolutely. On things uh, in something like Trifecta, we add green sand and we also add azomite. Green sand and azomite are rock dusts. That means there's going to be 60 to 70 other trace minerals still found in this, but they're in such, uh, such small trace mineral quantities that we can't really register them on a guaranteed analysis. They are in there, but from a label standpoint, you can't state you know, that there's like 0.0001% of molybdenum. They don't allow that. It's just not really allowed on a, on a label. And so um, that is how you kind of can tell what the composition is based on the, the, the three numbers as well as the total breakdown. So finally, I wanna end on what these nutrients actually do for your plants. So a lot of people kind of wonder like, well, what does nitrogen actually do for my plants? What does phosphorus do? So we're gonna talk about those things because it's really important that you find a fertilizer that's gonna work for you and what you actually need in your garden. So we're gonna use Trifecta Plus as an example here because that's what we use in our garden and I absolutely love it. So with things like nitrogen, nitrogen is going to be something that your plants are gonna use for foliage growth. It actually helps with the greening of the plant. It helps with leaf production and growth. Um, now your nitrogen can be broken down, as I stated kind of briefly, your, your nitrogen source can be both fast acting and slow release. Don't get hung up on those things as much because your plants are gonna use the nitrogen the same way. That just has to do with how long it takes it to be plant available. It might be ready right away, and that's the water soluble plant available nitrogen. And then there's nitrogen that might need to be broken down a little bit by some bacteria and fungi and stuff in the soil, and that can take longer. That can take more like three to four months. And so you have two different forms of nitrogen, but your plants will use the nitrogen exactly the same way when that nitrogen becomes plant available. So that is nitrogen. Then you have the phosphorus. Phosphorus deals with root development as well as flower development. So if you're growing something like a tomato, a lot of people run into some issues when they don't give it enough phosphorus because if you just keep pushing nitrogen in it, the plant will continue to grow, be nice and green, but eventually it needs to flower. And so that's really where, you know, again, trifecta is great because it's time released so that when the tomatoes are ready to start flowering, they're gonna start tapping into some of this slower releasing phosphorus that is great for the, the tomatoes at that stage in their life. And so phosphorus is good, like I said, for roots and flowers and other things as well, obviously, but this is, you know, the, the these are kind of like bullet point things. You can obviously learn a whole lot more about them, but these are kind of the surface level knowledge that you should know about these nutrients. And then there is potassium or potash. And potassium is what deals with plant vigor and plant health. If your plant is diseased, if it is slow growing, if it is prone to things like pests, if the leaves are super thin and kind of anemic, Potassium is most likely what it needs. Um, things like potatoes, tomatoes, any fruiting crop will fruit more as well because there's more vigor with more potassium. And so that's the, again, that's the third number in your three numbered list. And that again, just deals with plant health and plant vigor. Now you can go into other things like calcium. Well, what does calcium do? Well, calcium deals with things like cell structure. Cells in plants are a lot different than cells in the body. Cells in the plants have what's called a cell wall. We have bones, that's why I can stand up and do all this crazy stuff, because I have bones. Plants don't have bones, they have cell walls. And those cell walls are made up of a rigid structure of calcium. And so that is actually what gives your plants rigidity. If your leaves are super weak and feeble and kind of limp, they might need some calcium. Also, calcium helps with things like fruit development when it comes to tomatoes, squash, pumpkins, peppers. If you notice something called blossom end rot, that's a lack of calcium. And so calcium can help with even that as well. And then you have other things like magnesium, right? Magnesium, it works in combination with things like nitrogen to help the plant. So magnesium helps in a different way than nitrogen does, but it still helps with kind of green, greening up the plant giving it vitality, helping it to just continue to grow. And there's a lot of things that happen on a cellular level that is way too in depth for this episode. But again, those are kind of some things that you just kind of touch on. Also, there's lots of things, like I said, like iron, magnesium, uh, molybdenum, sulfur, 
so many different, you know, boron, right? There's so many different trace minerals that exist that I can't go into all of them, but they do help on a cellular level, the plant to be healthier, have more well-rounded health, and it's the equivalent of you taking a multivitamin. Um, it's the equivalent of you having a well-balanced diet. And so on the back, you're gonna see a lot of those, but also, even though, even though you don't see them and you don't see a number doesn't mean they don't exist, like I said. And there is a really important thing to know about nutrients, and that's that all the nutrients you have in this fertilizer will help your plants. But if the fertilizer is not well balanced, your plants cannot be well balanced, right? So if you need something like boron or you need something like molybdenum, these things that are really super small quantities, and you don't know if it's in there, you can't guarantee that your plants are getting it. And so on a very important level, I always stress going with a really high quality, well-balanced fertilizer that's going to have a bunch of different things in it. If you just go with something like a, you know, a 10 and it has, uh, you know, ammonium nitrate as the, uh, as the, the ingredient source. Okay. Well, you know that you have 10% nitrogen, but it's not even like it's a byproduct of an animal industry or uh, you know a byproduct of uh, a mineral source or anything like that. It's just a lab-made chemical. So you're gonna be getting exactly that. There's no other ifs, ands, ors, or buts about it. And so it is very much like just, it's like, it's like sugar in a diet, right? You need carbs for energy, but you can't live on sugar alone for crying out loud. And so, it's really important to go with a well-balanced, uh, very diverse ingredient-based uh, nutrient source, in my opinion, because it's gonna give you everything your plants need. Now, the very, very final thing I'll end on is that do you need to go with a fertilizer in a bag? And the answer is no, you don't, but it's gonna be a very efficient vehicle to get nutrients to your plants. It's gonna be very uh, cost effective because the amount of nutrients found in this bag is the, is the amount of nutrients you might find in say 10 or 20 yards of compost. It's extremely concentrated because it's, it's different. It's not an apples to apples comparison. And so uh, a little bit goes a very long way with things like bagged fertilizers, but you absolutely can feed your plants with things like compost. We grow in compost every single year. But if you wanna give your plants that extra boost, make sure that they're being taken care of that much more. That's where fertilizers come in and you have a whole lot of options to choose from. So I hope you guys enjoyed. I hope you learned something new. If you have any other questions, I'll try to answer them in the comments box down below. But as always, this is Luke from the MI Gardener channel reminding you to grow bigger. Take care guys, bye.